Hello, everyone. My name is Becky Robinson, and I'm so thrilled to be here today with Judy Douglas. Welcome, Judy. Glad to be here. Thank you, Becky. So folks are beginning to join us both here on Zoom and on the broadcast live to Facebook. So welcome to those of you who are coming. We're so thrilled that you've chosen to invest some time with us today learning about Judy's new book, When You Love a Prodigal. I'm guessing that many of you all have known Judy for many years as I have, but if you could take a quick moment as you're arriving and locate the chat window, we would love to hear a hello from you. Judy will be looking at this chat later. Um, what I'm going to ask is that you select all panelists and attendees. In that way, everyone on the call can know you're here. You can maybe see some old friends who've decided to join today's broadcast. So if you could take a quick moment, tell us hello in the chat, and we would love to know where you're calling in from and what brings you to today's event. So welcome to many of you who are beginning to join both here on Zoom and on the Facebook broadcast. Welcome. Uh, as I mentioned before, my name is Becky Robinson. I'm thrilled to be here with Judy Douglas. So a couple of other notes about today's event. We are recording today's event. So in the event that you have friends or colleagues or family members or neighbors or anyone else in your life who might benefit from today's broadcast, we will be sending out a follow-up email and you will be able to share this recording with anyone you would like to who could uh, benefit from it. So welcome to those of you who are talking to us in the chat. I would encourage you again to select all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your post. Um, otherwise, only Judy and Kelly and I will be able to see that post today. Um, so welcome. And uh, some of you are starting to share your stories in the chat as well. So one of the things I want to let you know is that later on in today's broadcast, we will be taking some of your questions and sharing them with Judy. So you, I want you to feel free throughout the broadcast to type any questions. Uh, the other thing is that immediately following the formal webinar presentation, we will be joining a different type of Zoom link where you can be face to face and talk directly with Judy. So toward the end of today's event, we will We'll share that link and we will welcome you to join us once this formal presentation has concluded on that Zoom webinar um, meeting um, where you can be face to face and talk directly to Judy. So thanks to many of you who are greeting us in the chat. Uh, it looks like quite a few crew staff, uh, some people around the world. I see London, I see, you know, Colorado, Florida. Uh, so thanks to to all of you who are joining. So as we dig in today, I want to make sure I introduce Judy to all of you in case any of you are new to Judy. Uh, from what I'm seeing so far, many of you do know and love Judy, just as I do. Um, just a little bit of background about me. I was a part of CREW as a college student and you know, was aware of Judy and her work at that time, I think, with Worldwide Challenge Magazine. But I never met Judy until 2011, and we met on Twitter first and then later in person. And Judy, I've been so thrilled to have your encouragement in my life. So those of us who know Judy know that she is an author and uh, a speaker and a mother and a grandmother and an important part of crew ministry. Um, and the work she does now is related to women's resources. So welcome Judy and congratulations on the launch of your new book, When You Love a Prodigal. Oh, I'm so excited about this book. <laughs> it's, it's been a 12 year or more process, maybe more like 15 or 20 from the very beginning. And, and so people say, how long did it take you to write it? Well. The actual writing, I suppose, we worked on for a couple of years, but the, the living it out and writing letters to the Prayer for Prodigals community was a many, many year process. So it's, it's a long journey and I'm glad that we have it tangible. It's so. amazing, definitely. So Judy, um, why don't we start today by really talking about the basics. I would love it if you could define for us um, what you mean when you say prodigal. Well, I'm going to read to you then this very short definition that I have in the book because people are always asking this question. Originally, the word prodigal meant extravagant, lavish, abundant, and bountiful. And you wonder, well, how do you get prodigal that we use out of that? Well, it just was added to it that those kinds of things were the way some people were and they took it to extreme. So it basically means now a person who is 
extravagantly wasteful, lavishly reckless, abundantly profligate, and, and making life decisions that are not good for them or even dangerous. So that's where it comes from. And it is what people think of often as, uh, in for believers, it's somebody who has walked away from their faith and their relationship with God. But it also means pretty near anyone who's making bad decisions, um, doing the kinds of things that will be harmful for them or their future or even for other people. So it's a pretty broad group of people. And I don't know anyone almost who doesn't at least know someone in that category. Many who have family members in that category. One last thought on that, it's not just children. We, most people think, oh, a person who would care about a prodigal is the parent of one. And that would be the majority for certain. But it could be the child concerned about a parent. It could be a spouse. It could be a sibling, a, a relative of some kind, or your best friend. It, it just really could be anyone. So anyone in your life who's choosing to go down a path that's harmful. Yes. That's pretty much it. That's really helpful. So Judy, let's talk about some of the reasons or causes that prodigals go astray. Okay, well, the most common and the one that people most would notice is it's just kind of a natural part of growing up is to start to have questions about who you are, your identity, wanting to differentiate from your parents and, and, and be independent. And so for many, they would choose to try a little this or a little that to prove that they can be more adult. <laughs> Not really, but, uh, and, and so it, for many, it just is a brief time of, of identity search. And, um, but for um, a lot, some of them, many of them, it can be a lot more than that. And they, they make some choices that lead them down a path that would include drugs or alcohol and they get addicted. Did you know that with alcohol, one in six people, one in six who ever taste alcohol will become alcoholics. And, and so people think nothing about having a drink. And so that's just one example. Drugs can do the same kind of thing. If you have addictive tendencies, then those things happen. Some of it is acting out in other ways. Um, it would certainly, there's sexual exploration going on uh, for many people, and that can cause a lot of issues for them. But that's just one area. Um, there are some others that I would mention. Um, well, our son, I asked him this. Uh, he's 36 now. You'll hear a little more about him. But I said, so why did you do all the things that you did? He said, well, basically, because it was fun and my friends were doing it. <laughs> and, and so friendships are probably one of the most important things. Who your kid hangs out with or who this person you're concerned about hangs out with has a, a great role to play in it. Because if even one in a group decides to deviate a little and try some risky behaviors, then the others can be induced to do that as well. And so friends are a huge part of it. But there's also um, a lot of trauma kinds of things in a lot of people's lives. Now, our son is adopted. And so for him, he had issues of um, a father who didn't show up, a mother, who, um, well, she chose her addictions. And so therefore neglected or allowed her son to be um, in dangerous situations with her, where he experienced abuse, where he also experienced lack of secur security in his life. And in the end, he was taken away from her. Um, but then there are other kinds of trauma. So somebody who's had a terrible accident or something, and it changed their lives. Okay, that creates a PTSD kind of situation. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the acting out comes from various traumas in their life. And it may have been done by somebody else. They may have been abused in a situation, and the family didn't know anything about it. 
And so then they wonder what's going on and why is this child acting this way? Uh, and if they can search and get some counseling help, then it can come out what it perhaps was the cause of it that nobody knew about. Another area that is interesting is the, is the whole area of various kinds of mental health issues. Um, and just, uh, I have some people who do some study on this, but a lot of the depression uh, that we are seeing, and you know, for now, who knows how much that's living on screens or how much that's uh, therefore not living face to face with people um, or lack of strong relationships. But then there are people who are diagnosed as bipolar or oppositional or um, borderline personality, various kinds of things. And those are really the cause more than a choice. And so the, most people think of a prodigal as someone who's just making choices. Well, they're often making choices, but the cause of it may be just their own will, or it may be abandonment or other trauma issues, or it may be mental disorders that need to be taken care of as well. And so it's not all this is just a bad kid, or this person's just rebellious, and some of it is that, and a lot of it is. But in the end, they do end up making choices, but the instigating cause of those choices varies. And we're wise before judging uh, a person's character, that we look behind the scene if we can and find out what the reasons really are. Yeah, I was just listening to, to you, Judy, and I was thinking how great wisdom is likely required in dealing with any prodigal um, to be able to see into those different contributing factors that might cause someone to go astray. Um, I have a kind of a side note question. As you were talking, I wrote down the word prevention. So I'm wondering, you know, in case there are any folks on the call who may not consider their loved one a prodigal yet, but may see some of those warning signs. Do you think that someone choosing to walk away as a prodigal is something that's preventable? And if so, what, what might those uh, preventative actions be that we could take? Well, yes, I think it is preventable. I don't think it always ends up being that. But I would say the most basic thing that someone who loves a prodigal can do is keep strong relationship with the person. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're talking to parents, which is still the majority of people who, who listen to this and, and uh, think about that, um, it's so easy for parents to be so busy or a, a friend even. I mean, how many of us have time to get with our friends when really all they really need is somebody to listen or to encourage them or to be there for them. And so working on relationship to me is the most important thing that a person can do no matter who they are. Clearly prayer is one of the most, it would be even more important if that is something that you would believe you can do and that it can make a difference for me and i'll talk about this more later probably is prayer has been my lifesaver uh, because instead of just talking to my friend who might be wonderful and i've had wonderful friends with you know who walked through this with me and my husband who's walked through it with me and even our daughters um have had to to make adjustments and learn uh walking through it with their uh later in life for them brother and um but i can go to god anytime and he not only will listen and encourage my heart but he can actually do something and i would say there's this in romans 2 chapter in romans 2 verse 4 it says in various translations it says he god says don't you know it is my loving kindness that wins them back, that draws them, that woos them. And so even when they're making choices that frighten us or make us angry or confused or we're, we, how did this happen? We raised you differently. How can you be doing this? And, and God himself says, well, the way I most often approach it 
is with loving kindness toward the person. Uh, which is why the book in the subtitle, it talks about 90 days of grace for this wilderness journey because we we're, we're need to give a lot of grace. And that's possible because God gives us so much grace. And one of the things that I say is that we are all prodigals. And so understanding our own areas of, of weakness or temptation or past choices that we've made, um, if we can stop and think about that, then it helps us to be able to come alongside, step into relationship with this loved one in a way that um, says, okay, I get it. I understand. I've been there. Can we talk about where this goes and how you would want to move to a different direction? Uh, so conversation, communication, love and grace, those kinds of things. So J Judy, it's so interesting that you said that we are all prodigals because as you were talking, that was what was coming to my mind. And I'm curious for those of you who would be willing to answer in the chat, how many of you can identify with that statement of, you know, really understanding at different times we have all gone astray or made choices that weren't aligned to what others expected of us or weren't the best choices for ourselves. Um, I would love to hear from you if, if that's something that you can identify with and Judy, I love that perspective that you're giving us, that if we can understand the grace that we've received, that then we can be so much more prepared to give grace to others. Let me give you an example there. Yes, please. My, my husband is a very hardworking person. Uh, he's a very disciplined person. <laughs> so God sent me to him, uh, not as disciplined. And, uh, <laughs> but for him, our son, Josh, um, in his teen years especially, wouldn't work. He just wouldn't work. He'd even have jobs and, and they didn't last long because he was, we called him the most creative work of order we'd, avoider we'd ever seen. And it just drove him crazy, my husband, because for him, that was a high value that you work and you work hard and you, you do responsibly uh, what's before you to do. And so he would find himself feeling anger at our son. And then the Lord would say, so let's talk about the gap here. So how far is the gap between you and your son? Oh, it's pretty big. It's, you know, as far as values of responsibility and hard work. He says, now, how far is the gap between you and God? And, and the, every time he'd say, oh, Lord, I, you're right. And it would help him to step back and, again, have compassion and, and grace for our son. He still needed to grow and learn responsibility and work. But rather than judge him based on what we valued entirely, we needed to be able to step back and say, you know, if God looks at me, he has far more reason to be uh, disappointed, at least, if not pushing us away. But that's not what he's done. And so we need to look for the ways that we can keep loving, help them grow, uh, but, but being there, not pushing away. That's really helpful, Judy. Thank you for sharing that story. And thanks to those of you who are sharing in the chat about identifying with the statement that Judy made that that we are all prodigals. Um, we wanted to spend a few minutes, and we've started to do this already, Judy, but can you talk to us and share some more stories of how people can help loved ones turn and return? Yeah. So our son, just to give a little background there to, to understand, he was almost 10 when we received him as a gift from God. God had told me he was sending us a son and it took a long time and we were fine and I wasn't really looking for this gift. But I said, oh no, he's coming and he did. And um, we were not at all prepared. Uh, even though we took classes because he came first as a foster child before later we adopted him. And uh, coming in at almost 10, having grown up in the situation I mentioned of uh, the insecurity and uncertainty and even danger of, uh, with his birth mom. Um, so he could barely read or write because she hardly took him to school. Uh, 
um, and he was in third grade, which is two years behind basically what age he would be in, but even that he could not do. But he had from fetal alcohol syndrome, the um, results of her drinking and, and drugs while she was carrying him creates serious issues for somebody. The first and most obvious one is the prevention in the brain of the necessary synapses, I guess, I'm not a scientist here, for the ability to do cause and effect reasoning. So you say this, you do this, this is the result. No, that didn't happen for him. There was no result, he couldn't understand it. And the way he could learn that if you do this, was to, this would happen, it was repeated times of building that connection in his brain. And so we would say, did you turn out the light in the garage? And he would say, yes. And, but he didn't. <laughs> and he just didn't think that it mattered. He, you know, because he had no sense that if you say that something, you don't want to lie. You, you know, so that's, that's just one thing. He was ADD, had a serious learning disability of, uh, of storage retrieval. He would put something in his brain and then go to find it and uh, it wasn't there. And so things we did was we did get some help. We, not as much probably as we could have, but we got some counseling and we studied and learned about these things so that one of the things that we did, now this is not something someone else would do because it might not be the same issue, but we, we did some brain repatterning exercises with him because he needed to grow his, brain's ability to handle life. The fetal alcohol syndrome had limited that. And so mm -hmm. we did for a year and a half every day, about an hour of these exercises. So what the point of that is, you look and see what are the needs that can be helpful to this person, because they're gonna be different. And so what can we do to help them? Obviously, you spend time with them, you love them. We did everything we could to include our son in the kinds of activities. We helped him meet people that would be positive people in his life. And, mm -hmm. and we uh, sent him to church camp and church youth group and all of those kinds of things. And, and certainly uh, listened to the word. We had Bible studies together. So we, we tried to invest in them in understanding the truth of a relationship with God. Uh, we did not push it and force him. He did not actually come to Christ till later, but um, that that helped. Um, Gary, oh, not Gary. Okay, there's a, a, somebody who talks about parenting and marriage, and he says the most important thing for you can do for your family is to take them camping. Hmm. Um, and uh, well, Steve and I aren't big campers, so we didn't actually do that. The humor. <laughs> All three of our children love to go camping. And I said, I don't know how that happened. But he says, what happens when you're out there in the open, in the nature, and you don't have all the technology around you, especially if you, you know, don't have recharging ability or, uh, and, and you talk to each other and you get to have a look at what life out there is like and you see the animals and you see the stars in the sky and and you rough it a little bit and it it just creates much more of a bondedness in a family that's the kind of thing now if they're moving along in a more dangerous kind of situation um often you're going to need some outside help um we had our his school uh actually tried to help us some with them because he was such a problem at school. Um, he was bigger than everyone. Uh, so he learned to be a bully. Uh, and that included stealing from younger kids, their lunch money so that, you know, he could have some. But um, so uh, the school helped us with some things. Those did not turn out to be very helpful, though they should have because they were really wise, but it just wasn't working. So other kinds of things that will be helpful is watching how you say things uh, and because i'm going back to the other than the lord and praying the most basic thing is building relationship one that's trusting one that cares about and shows real love for 
that means that uh, you don't try to make them be like you. Uh, parents often push them into activities that they want them to do. Um, and our daughters both, well, Josh did as well, but our two daughters both played soccer. One of them was very competitive, very athletic, and played all the way through college. The other one started playing because her sister did, and she saw it was a family activity. And she also had her best friend was playing. So she actually played soccer for six years. She probably enjoyed the first three when she was five and six and seven. But then she really didn't like it because she was not a competitive person and she was much more artistic and she cared about people. And she started her counseling ministry, which she's a counselor when she was 12, because uh, all her friends would come to her. And so finally she said, I don't want to play soccer anymore. And we're like, you've never had to, it's your choice. And so, but once she signed up, we made her continue. So the last time she said, I wanted to play because my daughter, my friend is playing. And she said, can I quit? Yes, you can quit. And she was so happy. And we started doing art classes and she was ecstatic in doing those art classes. And she loved them and did them for years. And we would go to art shows and art museums. And that's not always my thing, but it became my thing because it's what mattered to her. And so to get on their page, to understand them and what matters to them and make it possible for them. Those are a few things. There are many others. So I've been seeing a few different questions, uh, Judy, on the topic of balance between loving the prodigal and also setting boundaries. And the related question I'm seeing is, you know, is there a time when a person should retreat from a prodigal? What if the prodigal tells you to leave them alone? So can you talk a little bit about how you balance loving the prodigal and setting appropriate boundaries when needed? Well, definitely you need appropriate boundaries. Um, I do not choose to um, put those in place with what is the popular phrase of tough love. Um, they may fall in that category, but when people start and say, well, I had to use tough love, uh, generally that is a push away feeling and the person doesn't feel like they're loved and cared for necessarily. Now, I'm going to get a little more there just a minute, but they feel pushed away and rejected. But you can come in and set boundaries, and they need to be uh, good boundaries that will be helpful for family cohesiveness and happiness and for safety for everyone involved, and, and those are important. When you set boundaries, you do that um, very clearly. Uh, you do it with clear understanding of the expectation and what the boundary is and clear consequences if you don't abide by that boundary. That's important. But you don't do it in your angry voice. Um, you don't do it, all right, this time we're done. You, we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. One time my son did something that really upset me really, really upset me. And I was really sad, but also very angry. And so I just said, okay, don't even come home. And then I stopped before I finished that sentence. I, I, he said, what, you want me to leave? And I went, no, I don't want you to leave. I want you to come home. And I want us to talk about how we can work out these differences here. And, and so we are the adults, supposedly, if you're talking about a child. When you're getting with other adults, there's a lot less opportunity. Then you have to set more boundaries that protect yourself because they're totally adults. But if a child, first of all, if they're under 18, you can't kick them out or you can go to jail. So um, it's, it's much more of how we present the boundaries and the expectations and even how we enforce the consequences. So when my son was 20, 21, he was living at home and he had a girlfriend and she was over every day to our house and um, would have stayed all night if we had let her, but we would not. <laughs> and they both said, we're adults. We can do what we want. 
well, yes, you can, but not at our house. And, and so when uh, they were at nine, 12 o'clock, I would have to set the alarm to get up to make sure that she had left because that was the deadline. She had to leave by, by midnight and, and they would get mad sometimes. But anyway, what it came down to was that um, my husband said, you're, you're disrespecting us. You're dishonoring us and our home by your behavior. And so you are choosing to move out. And he said, I'm not choosing to move out. You're kicking me out. No, no. You knew what was the expectation and you knew the consequence. And I'm actually going to give you a little time. You need to go find a job and a place to live. And, um, but then you need to move out. And so in a few weeks he came, he said, well, I don't think I'm going to be ready. I don't have a job yet. And he said, I'm sorry, but you knew what the requirements were and the, re the consequences. So he moved out and we weren't happy with what happened with that. Uh, but we said, you're welcome to come see us and visit us. We want to be in relationship with you. So that we are like, Luke 15 is such a guide to me in how we treat our, these loved ones. Um, and, and so we're the father who's waiting and when he sees the son who came to his senses and is coming back, he runs and grabs him and hugs him and throws his robe on him and says, let's go celebrate. And that's how God feels and that's how we should feel. And therefore that's how that loved one should feel. Now there are situations where um, that require more, um, strictness or not harshness but stronger measures if a person is dangerous you have younger children for example and and this person's coming in and bringing in wrong people or uh, who are a danger perhaps to your younger ones or drugs and alcohol or cutting themselves and you know all these kinds of things that might be going on um, then you might need to say, we love you and we're glad for you to visit with us. We want relationship, but we can't have you living here because you continue to choose activities that are not acceptable for our family. And that doesn't mean they won't ever get mad. They might, but, and they may not receive it well, but you will have done it with grace, with a gentle spirit instead of a harsh spirit, and it can make all the difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Judy. Um, I, I'm wondering if there are any examples that you have from some of the families that you've known who have been in the Prayer for Prodigals community of some other examples of boundary setting or other stories of people's experiences with identifying appropriate boundaries and communicating them in love. Um, I, I would say that most often at the beginning the those happen because of frustration at the situation where you feel like you've said and done and taught and modeled hopefully the things that should be true and they continue to choose another path and that is frustrating and and so we might often start out with a, an angry approach and i've i've seen that happen quite a few times i so a woman wrote to me and she said, our son gets out of jail this week and we told him he can come home, but we have younger children. And so we are going to say to him, if you do anything that we consider um, frightening for these children, we're cutting off all relationship with you. And I'm like, no, no, no. You can certainly say, come home and see if this works out. But if not, you're going to need to move out because we have to protect the others as well. And, and I said, but, but don't tell them you're cutting off the relationship to them. That was the boundary they needed to set. And I'm like, I'd rather you didn't do that. And so she wrote me back about a week later. She said, thank you so much. That would have been a terrible thing if we had done that. So we have asked him not to stay at home. He can come and visit. We want him part of the family but he needs to go live somewhere else. And he's accepted that, um, not happy at first. So that would be one example. Um, 
I, I know of a friend who's, um, her daughter has been up and down and does well for a while, which was true of our son. After he came to Christ, he made good progress and then he crashed. And those were usually longer. <laughs> and her daughter would do well and actually get involved in ministry. She had a beautiful singing voice and would be do concerts even with some others. And um, and then she would get back with people who were uh, doing drugs and um, and and so they basically again did their best to maintain relationship, but they said you need to not live here because of the choices that you're making. And uh, so she moved out and some of the time she would do well. And other times, again, it mostly had to do with getting with the wrong people. And uh, you would get with the wrong people and <laughs> the influence is incredible. So you hear people talk about their friends matter incredibly. Their friends do matter. Mm -hmm. and and so um it it's worked they have a good relationship with her now and uh she's in a, a much better place but they've learned that here's the thing people think okay they're back they came back they turned from their bad choices they're making good choices for their life and they think we did it we've made it and then they find out that relapse is unbelievably the norm uh, it, it just happens. So many of them have to find out that it takes more effort and diligence on their part than just, okay, I made it, I'm, I'm back. And, mm -hmm. and so they're, the parents or the family or others who love them are just like, what? You were doing so well. Why did you go back? And um, so, and we're also, we're oblivious a lot. So I have a friend who has a book coming out soon. Um, you'll want to read it. I cried through it. So it's called A Prayer for Orion. And um, her son, um, they found out but when he almost died from a heroin overdose, was seriously involved in drugs. And they didn't know it. They'd made their home a place where he and his friends hung out. And they'd kind of fixed up a kind of attic room where they hung out and did things and watched TV and played music and, and talked to each other and everything. And before long, you know, they were doing things they didn't know about because they were trusting them. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden she gets a phone call from the hospital and they're not sure they're gonna save him. And he should not have lived from this heroin overdose. but the world of their world prayed and God was kind and, and he lived and, um, and he did so well after that. He was so frightened by what he'd done and he did so well. And so trust grew and then it happened again. And, um, and he almost died a second time from a heroin overdose. And so it's, um, he's doing well right now but they have a whole lot better uh, antenna system uh, to to be aware of what's going on because they're smarter than we are. Here's what one person told me. If a person you know has a drinking or a drug problem, for example, if their lips are moving, they're lying uh, because they're going to tell you whatever you want to hear. And, uh, and so even when they're trying to do well, they have a pattern they've learned and it takes time and it takes a lot of prayer for them. Oh, the prayer that's needed. So, mm -hmm. so Judy, thank you. Can you talk about how you survived your prodigal and wilderness journey? With a lot of other people mostly and then god i'll get to that in a second but my husband and i walked through it a lot together um my the relationship that i had with josh was stronger um i'm the one who 
really felt that God had called us to do this. And my husband trusted that I was listening to God. And um, he, I'd have the stronger relationship with our son. But we prayed together. We talked together. One time when um, Josh was very disrespectful to me, Steve kind of walked over to him and put his arm up against him. He said, that is my wife you're talking to that way. And don't do that again. And, and that had an impact. It, it wasn't a, even an ugly thing. It was just really a firm. You, you can't talk to her that way. And so uh, we were there for each other, and especially my husband was. Our daughters struggled some because they lost a lot of me. And that happens when there's a, a prodigal in a family uh, because that person requires a lot of attention uh, and paying attention to, to know what's going on. And so both of our daughters felt that, you know, um, they felt a little abandoned by me because I, he required so much of my attention. We have talked about that and we're all okay and they love him and they care. Um, I don't know that they felt as positive then, but, um, so, but the family mattered and we kept him a part of the family. Um, his grandparents who had not been able to take him because they felt they were too old and not able to handle a child at that point, but I became good friends with them. And um, so they were very encouraging and together we wept and together we prayed. Um, mm -hmm. Probably one of the most important people was one of my best friends who just was there. So all I had to do was call her up and say, I was angry, I was hurt, I was scared, whatever. And she would listen and encourage me and pray with me. If needed, she would come over. She lived down the street. And, and so she would spend two hours at my house just letting me vent and talk and, and then we would pray. So she was a wonderful part of the journey. But undoubtedly, um, prayer, talking to God, and the Prayer for Prodigals community was a huge part of that. And what I want to do right now is go to the final question because I feel like it's such a powerful one. And for those who have stayed online with us, I want to make sure they get to hear about that final question. Um, you know, in the time that I've known you, Judy, you've talked about the gifts that you've received having parented a prodigal and the treasures that you found on this journey. And it's just crazy amazing for me to think uh, that you can look at it with such a positive perspective. So Judy, could you tell us a little bit about some of the gifts that you've received in loving a prodigal and how that's possible? Well, I, I actually, the last chapter in the book is called Gift, and I list eight there, but I'll just mention a, two or three here. Probably one of the most important was that Josh drove me into the arms of the Lord. We felt so helpless and nothing we were trying was seeming to make a difference and good, good steps always went but to bad steps. And, um, and so I went where I had to go and that was to the Lord. And, you know, I've walked with the Lord for mm, many, many years and I thought I knew how to walk well with the Lord and have a deep relationship. But this boy gave me a dependence on God that was beyond anything I experienced, uh, an understanding of who God was and what he was like and how much he loved me and how much he loved this kid that I was brokenhearted over. And so I will be forever grateful uh, to Josh for, for pushing me <laughs> into the arms of the Lord because I had no other place to go. Another thing related to that was is prayer. Now, I work with crew, and you know we um, <laughs> we pray a lot in our ministry. Uh, we pray. I usually, you know, most of us start the day with a little bit of prayer, and we pray at meals. But we also pray before we have meetings, and if we don't know what we're doing during a meeting, we stop and pray, and then afterwards we pray, and we we just pray a lot. But Josh caused me to come to a place of desperation. And, um, and so I learned how to have a relationship with God 
that was um, was relationship beyond anything I had experienced, that prayer was a conversation, that God was okay with my coming with my desperation and my begging him to intervene and do something here. But he would listen. He didn't he wasn't chastising me for my lack of faith. He wasn't shaming me because I wasn't doing a good job. He was listening and loving me, <clears throat> and his spirit working in me would give me ideas sometimes. But more than anything, God became a moment by moment. You know, Paul told us to pray without ceasing. That's what my life became like, that I just... Mm -hmm. Every breath was a conversation with God in a sense. And so what a gift to have that depth of a personal conversation and relationship with God. Uh, another thing that I, a gift that he gave me was an understanding of unconditional love. See, what happened was that along the way, I fell in love with this kid. At first, it wasn't easy because he was had a barrier, protect himself, so he didn't get hurt again by people who weren't dependable in his life. And, um, and so we just kind of made relationship that worked, but it wasn't very close. But then God just kind of took his own love and gave it to me for this boy. And so I'm, I love him. And um, eventually I kind of thought it'd be nice if he could love me back you know, <laughs> and no, because to him, he still, even though she was not good in his life, his birth mother was his mother. And so if he felt that if he loved me, that would be betraying her. And it took him 12 years to be able to say, I love you, um, mm -hmm. because it just took that long. And, and when I would go to God and say, can't he give love in return? And, and the Lord said, Jimmy, you're supposed to love him unconditionally. By definition means there are no conditions. Mm -hmm. If he never loves you in return, you can love him. If he abuses your love, if he disrespects you, if he breaks your heart again and again, you can keep loving because that's what my love God's love is, and it was in me for this kid. Um, one last one I'll mention, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's giving thanks. You know, when uh, when we're told to give thanks in everything, we we kind of go, uh huh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and when good things happen, if we're lucky, we remember to give thanks um, to God. But when the bad things happen, we're like how did you let this happen, God? And, and God taught me that he's serious about giving thanks, that if we can, even when our heart is broken or we're terrified, like my friend who gets the call from the hospital that her son is overdosed, that's terrifying. Mm -hmm. and, and God says, if you'll learn to trust me, then you will be able to say thank you. And so I began to practice it, kind of like Ann Voskamp talks about. Uh, and, but it became real to me to give thanks in everything. <clears throat> and I found that I could do it. Now, here's the good things that happened when I would say thanks. First of all, there was almost an immediate shift in my attitude from one of, of terrible fear or anger, or despair, to one of, okay, you're in it, God, so there is hope. Mm -hmm. um, and then it said to God from me, it said, all right, I believe that you're God. You could do something, but I didn't believe you're good. And anything that you do or even allow, it comes out of your goodness. And so I could, I could be thankful because I learned that I could trust God. Um, here's a, a funny thing that came as a result. I was teaching my kids these, this all the time um, because I was practicing it aloud because uh, my natural tendency would not be to give thanks. And so <clears throat> Josh used to do lawn work for a, a lot of years. And one time he was trimming a hedge, a big hedge, and he was using a chainsaw to get this big hedge. Well, there was a, a metal fence behind it. 
and the chainsaw got too close and hit the metal fence, caused it to jerk back and hit Josh on his head from his top of his head down to his eyebrow. And um, I get a phone call. Josh is on his way to the emergency room because he cut his head open with a chainsaw. And so I said, thank you, Lord, believe it or not. So I get there and it's not quite as bad as they thought. It, it did not break through the skull. So, uh, but he hasn't quite a scar. As they say, it looks like Harry Potter. And mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I was talking to him and he was in fair pain. And he said, well, the first thing I did was call 911 when I realized I cut my head open. The second thing I did was say, thank you, Lord. Hmm. I just went, it's contagious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was catching it so those are a few of the gifts that i have received my life is different in so many tangible and intangible ways because god sent this gift this boy to our family mm. it's a hard journey but i wouldn't trade it for anything Thank you, Judy. Uh, how amazing to be able to reflect on the gifts of loving someone, um, even when going through difficult times. Uh, what we want to do now is just show you one quick slide, Kelly, if you could um, share your screen and um, show the slide. We're going to move over to that um, webinar. Uh, web-based meeting for those of you who want to ask some more of your questions with Judy face-to-face. -face. But a couple of reminders quickly before we go there. Uh, JudyDouglas.com is a great source of valuable resources for you on this journey. If you don't already have a copy of the book, I would ask everyone on the call to buy one today. Um, buy one to share with a friend who might be uh, going through this uh, challenging journey of loving a prodigal. If you've already read the book, as I mentioned uh, during our little technical uh, difficulty, we, we would greatly appreciate you leaving a review for Judy wherever you bought the book, whether that's Amazon or Goodreads or Barnes and Noble or perhaps on a Christian website. Um, Judy has another Facebook event coming on September 23rd at 7 p.m. Eastern, and we will put the the link for you to RSVP for that event in our follow-up email, which will be sent this afternoon. So what we're going to do now is say goodbye and thank you to Judy on this link. And then um, Kelly will put the other link into the chat. It's also on Facebook um, and was in your reminder email that you got for today's webinar event. So we would welcome you to join us over there. You can come on camera and talk face to face with Judy. So thank you for your interest and participation. And Judy, we'll see you in just a few moments on that other link. I can't wait. Thanks so much. Take care.